everyone, and welcome to another edition of Space Warfighter Talks. I'm your host, Bill Wolf, the president and founder of the Space Force Association. We are honored to be speaking with Lieutenant Colonel Henry Heron today, who is the chief of space policy and strategy at the Joint Air Power Competence Center. And I probably messed that up, Colonel Heron. Uh, could you just let people know what your title is there? So fundamentally, I'm a, I'm a subject matter expert on space and then cyberspace uh, representing the U.S. Space Force at the Joint Air Power Competence Center. Got it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Before we get started, I would like to thank our individual members of the Space Force Association and, of course, our corporate members who are Braxton Technologies, Foresight, AGI, Numerica, Lockheed Martin, and Bluestack. Thank you so much for helping SFA realize our vision, which is to get the word out about the Space Force to help educate and advocate for the world's most superior Space Force. Colonel Heron, for folks who don't understand what NATO is doing in space, could you just briefly explain and, and really just let people know your background? What, what, what's your career? Certainly. Um, well, as I mentioned, I'm at the Joint Air Power Competence Center over here in northern Germany, and I've been here for a couple of years. It's a, it's a NATO accredited organization. And so before I get going too far, I do have to mention that you know, all of my comments here today are really my own comments. I don't speak on behalf of NATO or of the, the Joint Air Power Competence Center, the JAP CC. Um, I've been in the active duty military for closing on 30 years. Uh, really as a career space officer after serving some, some years as an enlisted member. Uh, I had the opportunity to really have a different career path from a lot of uh, my friends and colleagues in that I spent most of my career outside of what was Air Force Space Command, really uh, out overseas uh, in Europe and in the Pacific, really being uh, someone who's trying to integrate space uh, with uh, the air component and then with our joint and coalition partners. The, Thank you for that. Certainly. So the, the focus here right now on NATO is that uh, NATO in some ways is really where the U.S. was maybe a couple decades ago. Um, they just recognized, uh, closing on a year ago now, that space is an operational domain. And that, that followed uh, the first uh, overarching space policy that came out uh, in the summer of 2019. And, and they're really just still in those initial stages of trying to figure out, okay, well, we have an operational domain called space, and what is that gonna mean for us? Um, there's, there's a handful of subject matter experts uh, in positions within the NATO command structure, but really not very many. And so you have a, a group of, of dedicated, focused folks um, really, really working their tails off, trying to figure out how to integrate space uh, more completely into NATO operations. Got it. Thank you. And you talk about and you said the uh, NATO accredited center of excellence. Can you tell us a little bit about what that entails and how it supports the NATO mission specifically? Sure. So um, the, the folks that I just mentioned uh, are in the NATO command structure. So that's where all of the, the 30 member nations, they provide bodies into the command structure and they get, they get credit, right? It's their, their share of, of the workload. But outside the command structure, there's, uh, I think now it's about 27 centers of excellence. So we're not within the command structure. So the nations don't get credit um, for our membership, for our participation in these. But what that does is it gives us the opportunity to work with the NATO command structure, with the individual nations and try and promote growth of certain subjects uh, along four pillars. And the pillars being education and training exercises, analysis and lessons learned, uh, doctrine and standardization, and then concept development and experimentation. So the Joint Air Power Competence Center is focused on air and space. It, it's actually the first COE that was accredited by NATO back in 2005. And, and as I mentioned, I think there's about 27 now. So they've, they've grown pretty significantly over the last 15 years. And, and so for us, the, those are the things that we, we look at air and space within those contexts of, of, of those four pillars that I just mentioned. Understand. 
Recent reporting has mentioned German and French proposals concerning a space-focused center of excellence. Can you discuss the difference between the proposals and perhaps why personnel in the U.S. Space Force should be interested in these proposals, considering the ongoing efforts to stand up the Space Force? Well, that's a, that's a lot. So um, the first thing I would say is that uh, the, the German proposal that's out there on the table is really um, right now the the joint air power competence center it's it's we have a small space branch within that center and so by adding just a couple of billets uh in addition to the few billets that we have with with mm -hmm. italian german and, and u.s partners um participating there and doing that work as, as we have been over the last 15 years um that's the german proposal really is just to continue that to continue to meet the current needs of of nato the French are proposing a separate standalone uh, center of excellence. Uh, they're looking to build up a uh, significant uh, space sector within Toulouse, France, and they, they view that as what, what they see to be the European space hub, right, where they're really going to put a lot, of, a lot of emphasis on different facilities and organizations within that city. And so this would be something that they would build a couple years down the road um, that, that would then support uh, support NATO's requirements. If you if you look at uh, if you look at the current needs for NATO, which I, I think should be the focus, as I mentioned a moment ago, there's there's really not very much within NATO as far as space capability goes. So you have uh, you have about 19 uh, experts spread about the NATO command structure, and when I'm talking about experts, I'm talking about people people like yourself, like me, who are working space operations. Um, and and that, that, that 19, those are billets actually. And some of those folks aren't even actually, aren't career space folks. So you might have as an example, you might have someone that's in an Intel billet and as, and as a second hat to their position, they're also required to be the space kind of subject matter expert there within that organization. So when you get down to looking at who are the people who have experience in education and space within the command structure, you're probably getting down into single digits, right? And so as, as they grow with the, the recognition of the domain and trying to put an initial implementation plan forward, something along, along the lines of growing that appropriately is gonna be, is gonna be needed. Um, there was also, uh, you mentioned the reporting in the COE, there's also the reporting of the stand-up of a space center, which is going to be a RAM sign. So that, that's going to be stood up and that's going to, that's going to be providing that, that support to NATO to integrate, but it's really going to be integrating from a standpoint of, of taking national systems, national contributions in the, in the form of data products and services and fulfilling space support requests. So as, as NATO entities request data products and services, they'll do that through the space center and, and the space center will be in contact with the, the op centers in the various member nations like, like the CSPOC out there in, in Vandenberg. Okay, so let me just follow up on that. The, just to be clear, is it the expectation you have representation from all your NATO countries in, in to in the CSPOC or is that still under discussions? Well, the CSPOC is, you know, it's its own organization. So mm -hmm. it's, it's running, um, my understanding is they really uh, have focused on creating bilateral, or bilateral agreements between the U.S. and then different countries. And then, and they work out what kind of representation those folks would have, uh, those nations would have at the CSPOC. The Space Center is, is a NATO entity. So um, while they have this idea of having the space center has been approved. Um, I think there's still work to be done to figure out uh, what all the billets might look like if they increase billets, and then what nations will provide those billets. And, and they will look across the 30 member nations for expertise in filling those billets. And one of the questions that will pop up is, what type of experience and, and expertise with space will you bring in with those bodies, right? You may end up having you may end up having nations providing bodies that don't really have a background in space, and and they're going to come into the space center with someone who's done some type of a operations or support, and they're going to learn about space while they're doing that job. Okay, no, thank you. I appreciate you clarifying that. And then um, using your own 
career as a baseline and kind of how you created your expertise in space, what would be the expectation for folks to become experts in order to, to support the, the mission of the center? Well, I mean, so we talk about the, you know, I was fortunate enough to go to the weapons school uh, a number of years ago with, uh, with most of my instructors being old graybeards now and have moved on to uh, greener, or I guess in this case, darker pastures there uh, with your screen <laughs> background. Um, but that provided me an opportunity to go outside of, uh, you know, what was Air Force Base Command. And, and that was an important thing for, for the Air Force at the time to do, because what we put those space weapons officers out into the combat air forces to integrate. And, and some of it was integrating capability, but a large role was also educating and informing um, not just the, the AOs that we were working with, but also with the senior leaders to help them understand the best ways to go about uh, using space within the operations or, or leaning on space capabilities. And so that's something that NATO is going to have to grapple with here. As you, as you go to potentially add bodies uh, into this command structure, you're going to need some of those folks are going to have to show up already understanding, already having a, a background in space operations. Um, but there's probably still going to be some people coming in that don't have that background. So then there's going to be a training requirement. And, and you're, going to have, um, you're going to have the potential for competing priorities, right? So do you put... Uh, do you put a bunch of educated, experienced space operators at the space center, and because that's going to be the focal point, um, or do you do you maybe kind of do a mix and then also have folks out at the JFCs? Uh, NATO has three standing Joint Force commands, as well as the single service commands of which Aircom is one, and then oh, there's that COE proposal that's out there as well. So if if you if they do decide to proceed with the French proposal, well then that's going to be you know, 20 some uh, SMEs, people with background that will have to be experts because of the work they're doing. Um, where are all these folks going to come from? Uh, within the U.S., we've seen within the last year tremendous growth with the stand-up of Space Force. But I think we've also seen um, kind of a pulling back, right? The, the, the folks that are spread out uh, in, in billets around the world are, are kind of being brought back to the Space Force as the Space Force tries to organize. Um, and it's a huge uh, challenge that they're facing as they, they move things from Colorado Springs to the Pentagon, trying to figure out where Space Command's gonna go. Um, but that's not happening in a vacuum. Uh, the UK, Germany, Italy, and France have all also stood up or are in the process of standing up their own Space Commands. And these are some of the more prominent um, space capable nations within the alliance. So as they're doing the same internal shifting around and organization of their forces nationally, um, it's gonna raise questions about well, where are you gonna get these folks that, that can really carry water, not just in, uh, doing the day-to-day -day jobs, but educating and training their, their colleagues so that they really understand how to integrate space into the operations. And just to pull that thread just a little bit more, can you provide a practical example, uh, something from your past uh, in your career that you've had to bring that expertise and how you brought space capabilities in support of uh, any organization that you've supported prior to this one? Actually, I think there's even a decent uh, example from, from here. Um, okay. About a year ago, I had an opportunity to go up to the Joint Warfare Center up in Stavanger, Norway to, to take part in a planning for one of NATO's exercises. And, you know, space is, space is big, but space is also uh, very, it's very hot right now, right? I mean, everybody knows that there's a lot of momentum behind space and the, the furthering of, of integration of space, but they don't necessarily know a lot beyond that, right? They, they don't have that. So they get excited. Hey, we know there's space stuff. We want to, we want to integrate. We want to be able to work with this stuff. And so then you have people coming up as they're trying to plan an exercise going, hey, we want to we want to do this with the space capability and sit there and go well wait a minute what is it you're actually trying to do right what are you trying to achieve let's figure that out first and then we can start we can take a step back and go well is there a space option to help meet that need right or is there a space capability to help produce that effect 
Um, there may be, there may not be. There may be another option that it actually may be a, an easier way of going about doing things. Um, and, and so that, that I think is something that I've experienced throughout my career being, being outside of, of the traditional uh, space reservation, if you will, um, where folks, you know, they're excited about it. But they don't really know what to ask. They don't know what to ask for, but they know they want to they wanna come ask for a capability. But, you know, you should never start with the capability. You have to start with understanding what it is you want to do first. And so I, I think that we've gotten further along in the U.S. with that. But, but we're definitely, as I mentioned, I, I would say 15 to 20 years behind within NATO uh, with that same kind of development that, that we've done. And it took us a couple of decades to get where we are uh, in the U.S. And, and a lot of that work was done by, by space folks that, that went out and into the CAF to do that type of integration. Got it. Thank you. And you know, talking a little bit more about the current organizational structure over there, understanding, and we talked a little bit about this with General Saltzman last week about the responsibilities that the current directors of Space Forces have to the different areas of responsibility. Could you talk a little bit about the relationship that you have at the JAPC with the Director of Space Forces down at the 603rd AOC or at UCFE? So um, the, the official relationship is really that he, because he's at Ramstein um, and he's within the, the US command structure, he goes and integrates over at AIRCOM with NATO. But that's, that's something that's been set up uh, more recently for him to have that. But he's still very much in a, in a US billet in a US command structure, and then he goes over and supports, and he has a staff that helps facilitate that. Um, for me, I'm not integrating with, with USAFE, with F Africa. I'm directly supporting NATO. So, so while we might interact within working groups or, or, or sharing ideas or passing back and forth uh, different articles that we see or contributions that, that folks within Europe are providing, it's a very different role, right? So he's really very much in the U.S. Uh, USAFE, even UCOM. And I think it's, for my point, I'm, I'm actually interested to see how this transitions. Uh, it's my understanding that they're taking a look back in the U.S. about how that DS4 role is going to change and how it's going to shift. Uh, and now with a separate service and with a separate command, I would, I would almost expect that that DS4 position that we have traditionally had at, at MAGCOMS within the Air Force, I think that that's going to sh probably shift and go to the COCOMs now. So that you may see that DS4 role shift from Ramstein and go more down to Stuttgart and be down at UCOM, um, where there's already an LNO from Space Command. Um, I, I don't know if that's what's going to happen. It, it's just something that I can envision happening because the because the the space guy is no longer now supporting the JFAC. There's a, it's supporting the combatant commander. But that's still all within the U.S. command structure, right? So that's separate from NATO. So they do their own exercises, uh, which are U.S. exercises, and, and you get different nations invited in at different times to participate. Uh, but those are not NATO-led, uh, full, full of NATO exercises and, and operations. So there is, there is a slightly different approach uh, to how we do those things. I understand. Lieutenant General Saltzman discussed last week with, with us about the different perspectives we get from our international partners and, and that important perspective. As we in the U.S. see space discussed in relations to NATO, it is incumbent upon us to remember that other nations can view these discussions differently, both in terms of priorities and approach. What does that mean for you as you work in that international organization dealing with space-related issues daily? Um, well, first, I, I think he was spot on when he was talking about that last week. I had an opportunity to view that. And, and that's actually why I'm excited to have the opportunity today uh, to be able to speak with you is, is it, it really highlights um, these discussions. I, I think within the U.S. particularly, the, the focus on the behemoth task of standing up the U.S. Space Forces is, is all-encompassing. And, and so understanding what's going on in NATO um, is, is a, sometimes a lower priority, but also a less understood priority because, because NATO is not, as I've said, is not in the same place developmentally as the US is. And so 
being able to take a step back and go, well, these are the needs for the U.S. Space Force in the U.S., but, but what does that mean over in Europe? What does that mean if you're talking with, uh, with German officers or British officers or Polish officers who have their own national perspectives on what they feel is important to help not only the Alliance, but help their nation grow? Um, and they, they might not have the same background uh, in terms of developmental education, you know, we have Space 100, Space 200, Space 300, we have Weapons School, we have all these opportunities um, that, that just don't exist over, over here in Europe in all of the Alliance nations. Uh, they exist to a certain extent in some nations, but not across the board. And so understanding that, that just because it may seem like, like a, a bit of a distraction looking at NATO from the U.S., if the game's in play over here, right? Things are being developed. And so if, if you don't have a certain amount of, of interest or, or involvement, then what ends up happening is things will continue to develop based on, on what the other alliance partners are, because for them, this is the focus. Uh, and the U.S. runs the risk of not being in that conversation, right? They not, of not being well represented, particularly if they don't really take the time to understand where NATO's at versus where the U.S. is at. Yeah, that uh, brings up a good point about the feedback loop. You know, in your position, um, how is that information flowing? I, I know you're hosting events, you're, you're having events, and you're publishing articles. So how does that information flow? Could you tell us a little bit about the events and some of the products that come out of those? Okay. So uh, we do try to host uh, annually. This year, unfortunately, we had to cancel, but we, for the last 15 years, we've hosted a, an annual joint air and space power conference, um, primarily focused on, you know, military leaders uh, within NATO, but, but not exclusively. There have definitely been uh, academic, um, commercial interests, uh, and then uh, even some other think tanks, right, within NATO, the, the types of centers of excellence. Um, or folks working, for example, at the NATO Science and Technology Organization, right? So they come together for our conference and we talk about these issues. We produce a, a conference read ahead that allows for folks, not just within the JAPCC, but outside contributors to, to write articles that then focus on a specific theme that's relevant for the transformation of air and space power. And those, those are put out, printed copies of those are sent out to the leadership uh, of all the NATO militaries. Um, the last two years, we've been fortunate to have General Thompson come and speak uh, at our conference. And, and that, was, that was a great opportunity to bring, to bring a senior space leader over and, and allow him to see this is where NATO's at and these are the kinds of conversations that other nations are having with regards to space in particular. Um, we also have the opportunity twice a year to produce a journal. In the journal, uh, same thing. It's not written exclusively by members stationed at the, the JAPCC. Contributing authors come from across the alliance, military, civilian, um, academic, corporate. And, and so it, it becomes that venue and that for, for people to promote thought and ideas on things that we need to be looking at. And again, the, those journals are sent out uh, across the leadership, uh, not just at NATO headquarters, but the individual nations their national uh, leaders receive those. Uh, and we also have a social media platform. So we put these things out on, on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook so that, so that we can try and spread to a larger audience uh, the ideas that are, that are being discussed and promoted. And what is that website? If folks want to go look at the journal, what would they, how would they get there? It's japcc.org. And we have, uh, again, two journals a year. So we, we've just recently celebrated our 15th anniversary with journal number 30. And every one of those journals is available on the website. So I'm going back uh, as well as a, a series of white papers, different research projects, uh, the conference read aheads. There's a lot of really good resources that are kept on there. Uh, and again, not all of that is generated internally. A, a lot of that comes from outside contributions, uh, people who are trying to promote different ideas to, to help move NATO forward. No, that, that's great. I appreciate that. So what, and how long have you been there and what's next? So I've been here just over two years and uh, had the, the pleasure recently of trying to learn how to use the talent marketplace. It's still the Air Force tool. Uh, 
I think I, I filled it out correctly. I, nobody came back and yelled at me. So uh, looking to, to find out in the next couple of months where they're going to be sending me. Uh, I, I requested to go back to the, to the NCR back in the States. I think, uh, I think some of the experiences I've had here will help, uh, help bring a, a slightly different mindset to some of the offices that are there, particularly offices working with international engagement. But, uh, you know, waiting for, for the folks at AFPC to make those determinations. Understand. Thank you. The, a lot of topic about the European Space Agency's concern with orbital debris. Uh, is that something JAPCC is looking at in terms of the impact to potential operations? It is. And, I, and I'll tell you, this is one of the nice things about the, the JAPCC being outside the command structure, because we're able to have a relationship with the European Space Agency. So we're actually going to be hosting in the next couple of weeks uh, our joint air power, uh, joint air and space power uh, network meeting. And so the JASPIN. And we do that annually. And ESA, they show up with representation each year. And it provides an opportunity for these, these organizations to come in and present the things that they're working on. So this, this isn't a, a day or two of the JAPCC, just, you know, here's everything we're looking at. It's, it's really a round table opportunity for folks to come in. And, and when you look at space traffic management, um, we've had articles published in our recent journal and in our, our most recent conference read ahead that came out in June. Even though we didn't have a conference, we still were able to publish a, a, a fairly lengthy read ahead book. Um, that those are hot topics. And, and really within NATO, um, there's kind of four different areas of, of, of space that, that I see is, is you have you have the folks that are that are looking at space exploration in the US, you know, NASA, right? Scientific type things. And ESA definitely falls, I think, into that category as well. And then you also have the commercial uh, element, right? Who's who's gonna be trying to make some money by doing different things in space? And I think ESA has a role in that too. Um, and then you get over to the military side um, and you have the traditional space operations folks, folks that are really focused on understanding and operating in space. Uh, and then separately, you have the folks that are really using space as a utility, um, folks in the intelligence community and the communications communities, right? They're, they're not really operating in space, but they're using a space-based capability to help do their missions. And what's, what's interesting is that that third group, the group that, that I'm part of that are looking at space operations, that, that's the smallest group, right? That's that, those 19 billets I mentioned earlier. But there's a lot of people looking at, at, at space as a utility function or as a commercial function or as a scientific and exploration function. And the JAPCC, because we're not in the command structure, we're able to go out and talk to folks across the breadth of, of those different approaches. You, 19 billets, I know you mentioned that earlier, that doesn't seem like very many folks to cover down on uh, the European continent. No, no, it's really not. And, and again, those are billets. Uh, so when you, as I mentioned, you get into the, you start actually looking at the individuals um, and you get down to the folks that, that really show up the, on day one with a, with a background in space, with some education in space, that's a much smaller number. And so that puts a, a huge, a, a huge burden, not just on the people who have that experience, but it also puts a bit of a burden on, on the folks that are, well, I'm really here as an, as an, I think my example before was an Intel person, but now I'm responsible to go learn a bit about space as well so that I can keep my leadership informed. And again, I, for me, I think that's going to be the concern going forward is as, as they look to potentially increase those number of billets, do you get more educated, trained people coming in if so, where? Because, you know, as I mentioned, the nations have their own priorities. Um, or are you getting people who are coming in, you know, air battle managers or, or, uh, or tanker pilots or something. somebody who's, who's used some type of space capability, but they, they got to show up and go through OGT for, for a handful of months so that they can literally learn how to do their jobs. Um, that's going to be a very difficult balancing act uh, as they move forward to, so that they can provide quality support to the command structure. And I'd uh, just like to ask if there's any questions from our attendees in this webinar, please just go ahead and ask in Q&A and we'll get those in front of Lieutenant Colonel Heron. As we're talking about that and allowing folks to ask some questions, is there an opportunity to create a 
training center or an education center uh, there? Or is that something that you're exploring or working with JAPC on uh, that specifically? So a, lo a lot of training uh, for education is done at the NATO school at Oberammergau, or it's provided through national courses. Um, so so there, is, there is outreach done to look at, uh, even within the states, hey, are there courses in Colorado Springs that, that foreign partners you know, within the Alliance that they can go and attend and, and get the certifications? Um, so the courses are out there. NATO, through the uh, Allied Command Transformation at Norfolk, they've established various disciplines, right? What we would call kind of the, the functions. And each discipline has a department head, and the department head is responsible for overseeing the training, both the individual training and then kind of the uh, group training, you know, through exercises and the like. And the JAPCC is the department head for space, the, the one discipline that is within space right now. Um, depending upon which way this whole COE issue gets, uh, gets settled, that may stay at the JAPCC or that may end up going uh, over to Toulouse. Uh, but we take a look at the current requirements and ensure that those requirements are being met. So there's, there's a couple of courses and a couple of opportunities that are, that are currently out there. But as decisions are made on whether or not to increase the billet structure and, and provide bodies to those, that, that will have to continue to be reassessed um, annually, not just because that's the requirement, but because it's going to be changing annually over the next several years as, as they look to grow that, depending upon how decisions are made. And can you talk a little bit about that NATO Space Center and what the expectation is? And if it is to go to Ramsai, kind of what the function of that is going to be? So, um, you know, it was just approved last week. And uh, there's, there's a small group of folks that are down there that have just been just killing themselves, getting all the paperwork together and the, the proposal and trying to, to get that through. And, you know, hats off to them. Uh, hats off to them. They've done a great job with that. Um, it, it is going to be at um, at Ramstein. Um, I think I think it's I think it's safe to say I think it's going to develop as it gets put in. I think they probably have initial ideas, but you know, uh, NATO Secretary General, uh, you know, he made a comment after it was approved, said, "Hey, this is where we're going to go for for imagery and communications and all these things." And um, you know, I, I'm a little hesitant about that. I mean, this, this is definitely my opinion. Uh, I think the intel folks at NATO headquarters probably have pretty good RFI prices, RF, uh, RFI processes that have been in place for a while where they go out to the nations to try and fill those intelligence requests. Um, there's also a, a NATO Communications and Information Agency, uh, NCIA. Um, they, they work all the communications issues. And so they have, uh, they have work centers that are set up to ensure SATCOM needs for the Alliance. Um, it's not clear to me if they're now, all those requests are now gonna go through the Space Center um, if that's going to be necessary or appropriate, if, if those other organizations kind of already have a handle on that. Um, but, but when you look at uh, understanding intel about space threats, when you look at understanding uh, what's going on with GPS constellation, when you look at uh, space domain awareness, uh, those types of requests for space support along those types of things will definitely funnel through uh, that space center where up until now, those requests all went through NATO headquarters, which is really up at the strategic level. So we will drop that down and, and almost almost like a Durloth kind of relationship that, that might be something uh, particularly folks in the US are familiar with, where that NATO, that NATO Space Center can go directly to the C spot, right? It can go directly to similar operation centers in France and UK. Germany has the, the GSAC, right? Their, their space operations center. So that, that will kind of lower the level at which that coordination uh, has to be done. And, and they'll have to you know, determine the, the best way forward to, to support the collection of all those data products and services that are being requested. We talk about agility in the Space Force and you hear leaders talk about the requirement for agility and leveraging industry partnerships to help fulfill the space priority mission. Is that something that you're looking at at the JAPCC and how to leverage industry? And an example would be Starlink, uh, obviously critical capability to ensure uh, communication paths uh, from, from the US and, and around the globe. Could you talk a little bit about that? So um, it's kind of a yes and no. Um, the no part first, uh, even when they recognized space as an operational domain last year, the 
the leadership and the NATO uh, Secretary General are very, very clear. We are not, NATO is not looking to purchase space capabilities, right? The space capabilities reside within the nations. And, and it's going to, it appears it's going to remain like that for the foreseeable future, right? So this is, this is why that space center is going to be important because if there is some type of support needed, you're going to have to go to the nations to get that because that's, that's where the capability resides. Now on the flip side, um, when you start talking about um, concept development and experimentation and you have these industry partners that are out there and they're developing new types of capabilities, um, we definitely work with those folks because we're interested to know what those capabilities are coming down the pipe. And, and through our conference and through our journal, we provide a, a venue for them to not have a commercial, but to talk about the technology. So it, it's not so much a sales pitch for their widget, but talking about the capability and the technology behind that widget so that people can understand that and then look to figure out ways in which they can incorporate that into operations. And, and that is something that happens uh, on a regular basis. That If you look through our journals and our conference read aheads, you will see articles written by uh, industry partners that are doing exactly that, talking about new capabilities that are coming down the pipe. Thank you. We do have a question from the audience. And this is a U.S. Space Force bound 0462 Echo developmental engineer, AFSC. And she is heading to NATO's Joint Warfare Center with 10 years of space acquisitions experience, SMC and the NRO. Her question is, rather than education and training, would you support or are you aware of any short mid-career OPEX type opportunities for U.S. Space Force, common AFSC? Officers at maybe Vandenberg to gain some space operations experience or is 04 too late to go gain space operations experience? Um, so I'm, I'm not a functional manager. Um, I, I, think, I think what I've seen in, in my career, at least in the past, is that, that really we've had a lot of folks spend a, a large portion of their career doing uh, the operational work you know, in the squadrons, within the springs, uh, California, Florida, wherever. And, and so then really it's, it's how did they get that opportunity to get out and go be the integrator? Um, so as a, as a major already, and, and she's going up to uh, the JWC, she's gonna be that one of those integration type people. So um, she'll get a, a great deal of experience up there and, and she's gonna, I'd imagine she's gonna be quite busy because there, there's not really uh, a space element that's up there. Um, the Joint Air Power Competence Center actually has a, has an MOU with the JWC. So we, we serve as both the space and air red team leads for the major exercises up at the JWC. So that, so that you can have those types of, of scenario inputs that are overseen by people who understand air and space play. Uh, we also even send a cyberspace person up there as well to, to participate with that. Um, so, so having someone embedded the JWC is, is a step in the right direction and, and I, I, wish, I wish her well uh, and good luck and, and, and get ready. It's, it's going to be a busy time. Thank you for that question. And you talk about the war games out there, Colonel Heron. Could you talk about some of the critical lessons learned from the war games, even at the highest level? Um, you know, I, I, think, I think the thing that you have to look at is because NATO is so big. Um, and you have, you have a lot of different headquarters that, are, that serve as the training audience in these exercises. Uh, and the, the first focus in, those, in the exercises is obviously on certifying the training audience, making sure they get the training they need. Um, but because the training audience shifts around from exercise to exercise, um, you don't always get the focus repeatedly. So you, you might, at one headquarters, only be the training audience one time in an assignment. Um, so that in itself provides kind of uh, some lessons. Um, how do you get more exposure to those types of events for, for a larger group of folks? And, and when you have people spread across 30 nations, that, that can be a challenge. And so I think you, you see those kinds of things within the lessons learned of, of they, they might almost say that sometimes it's lessons observed versus learned, uh, but you have to keep in mind that the training audiences, even, even compared to the U.S. system, 
the training audience is really shifting and changing every time so that um, it's almost to be expected, right? But, but slowly and gradually, you know, the, the ball is being moved forward. And do you see, obviously there's a lot of objectives uh, from various domains um, in those war games. How much of the focus is on space objectives? Um, this is gonna be something that's gonna need to grow. Um, space does play in these exercises, but, but again, it's, it's probably where we were with exercises in the US, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago. But again, when you only have a handful of folks spread across the command structure, you'll, that becomes your body of people to go support an exercise, right? To go do the scripting and, and the, the development of the scenario and all of that. Uh, so you, you put a huge burden on this small group of folks. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, these, uh, these folks are really earning their pay. Um, and some of them have the background in space and some of them don't. Uh, we're fortunate, I think, in, in some instances to be able to lean on U.S. partners out of UCOM or, or other national contributors uh, from outside of NATO. Uh, but still, there's just not a big pool of folks. And they, they all generally top out it at Lieutenant Colonel, right? Uh, 05 in the US, but NATO structure is 04. Uh, so, so that becomes a challenge too, because you don't have those senior leaders that uh, they know space is important. They know, you know it's going places. They don't wanna be seen as a roadblock, um, but they don't necessarily have a background to always be able to ask the right questions, right? Um, because that's just not, that's just not in, their, in their, their toolkit that they've grown up with. Their focus is on, on other aspects. Thank you so much. Any closing comments as we wrap up here? One, I just really appreciate uh, this opportunity. Uh, you know, I look through some of these other warfighter talks and it's, it's general, general, general chief. And so uh, thanks for slumming with Lieutenant Colonel for the afternoon. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if we made it up into, into double digits on the uh, attendance meter, but to whoever else who did take time to, to sit and listen to me ramble on for a while, I appreciate you taking the time and uh, if anybody has any questions in the future, you can you know, send an email to the JAPCC. There's a contact email there on the, on the website, and uh, I'll, I'll work to provide whatever answers or, or amplifying answers that I can. And thank you. Thank you again. You bet. Thanks so much for taking time today. On behalf of the entire Space Force Association, uh, thanks again, Lieutenant Colonel Heron, for talking to us about all the great work that's happening over at the JAPCC. And we look forward to following the progress as you continue to move out on your specific objective to provide space capabilities to NATO. And uh, hopefully we can tag up again in the near future and have another space warfighter talk. I look forward to it. All right, thanks for your time today and talk to you soon. Have a great Space Force day, Semper Supra. Semper Supra.